Chapter 29. Ever heard the phrase, the silence is deafening? Yeah, that's a real thing. Immediately, I crumpled to my hands and knees under the weight of the other god's power. Silence enfolded me like liquid titanium. The cloying smell of roses was overwhelming. I've forgotten how Harpocrates communicated with blasts of mental images, oppressive and devoid of sound. Back when I was a god, I'd found this annoying. Now, as a human, I realized it could pulp my brain. At the moment, he was sending me one continuous message. You hate! Behind me, Raina was on her knees, cupping her ears and screaming mutely. Meg was curled on her side, kicking her legs as if trying to throw off the heaviest of blankets. A moment before, I'd been tearing through metal like it was paper. Now, I could barely lift my head to meet Hippocrates' gaze. The god floated cross-legged at the far end of the room. He was still the size of a ten-year-old child, still wearing his ridiculous toga and pharaonic bowling pin crown combo like so many confused Ptolemaic gods who couldn't decide if they were Egyptian or Greco-Roman. His braided ponytail snaked down one side of his shaved head, and of course he still held one finger to his mouth like the most frustrated, burned-out librarian in the world. Shh! He could not do otherwise. I recalled that Harpocrates required all his willpower to lower his finger from his mouth. As soon as he stopped concentrating, his hand would pop right back into position. In the old days, I had found that hilarious. Now, not so much. The centuries had not been kind to him. His skin was wrinkled and saggy. His once bronze complexion was an unhealthy porcelain color. His sunken eyes smoldered with anger and self-pity. Imperial gold fetters were clamped around Hippocrates' wrists and ankles, connecting him to a web of chains, cords, and cables. Some hooked up to elaborate control panels. Others channeled through holes in the walls of the container, leading out to the tower's superstructure. The setup seemed designed to siphon Harpocrates' power and then amplify it, to broadcast his magical silence across the world. This was the source of all of our communications troubles. One sad, angry, forgotten little god. It took me a moment to understand why he remained imprisoned. Even drained of his power, a minor deity should have been able to break a few chains. Hippocrates seemed to be alone and unguarded. Then I noticed them. Floating on either side of the god, so entangled in the chains that they were hard to distinguish from the general chaos of machinery and wires, were two objects I hadn't seen in centuries. Identical ceremonial axes, each about four feet tall, with a crescent blade and a thick bundle of wooden rods fastened around the shaft. Faces, the ultimate symbol of Roman might. Looking at them made my ribs twist into bows. In the old days, powerful Roman officials never left home without a procession of lictor bodyguards, each carrying one of those bundled axes to let the commoners know somebody important was coming through. The more fasces, the more important the official. In the 20th century, Benito Mussolini revived the symbol when he became Italy's dictator. His ruling philosoph philosophy was named after those bundled axes. Fascism. But the fascists in front of me were no ordinary standards. These blades were the imperial gold. Wrapped around the bundles of rods were silken banners embroidered with the names of their owners. Enough of the letters were visible that I could guess what they said. On the left, Caesar, Marcus, Aurelius, Commodus, Antoninus, Augustus. On the right, Gaius, Julius, Caesar, Augustus, Germanicus, otherwise known as Caligula. These were the personal fasces of the two emperors, being used to drain Hippocrates' power and to keep him enslaved. The god glared at me. He forced painful images into my mind. Me stuffing his head into a toilet on Mount Olympus. Me howling with amusement as I tried, tied his wrists and ankles, and shut him in the stables with my fire-breathing horses. Dozens of other encounters I'd completely forgotten about, and in all of them I was as golden, handsome, and powerful as any triumvirate emperor. And just as cruel. My skull throbbed from the pressure of Hippocrates' assault. I felt capillaries bursting in my busted nose, my forehead, my ears. Behind me, Raina and Meg writhed in agony. Raina locked eyes with me, blood trickling from her nostrils. She seemed to ask, well, genius, what now? I crawled closer to Hippocrates. Tentatively, using a series of mental pictures, I tried to convey a question. How did you get here? I imagined Caligula and Commodus overpowering him, binding him, forcing him to do their pitting. I imagined Hippocrates floating alone in this dark box for months, years, unable to break free of the power of the fascists, growing weaker and weaker as the emperors used his silence to keep the demigod camps in the dark, cut off from one another, while the triumvirate divided and conquered. 
Hippocrates was their prisoner, not their ally. Was I right? Hippocrates replied with a withering gust of resentment. I took that to mean both yes and you suck, Apollo. He forced more visions into my mind. I saw Commodus and Caligula standing where I was, now was, smiling cruelly, taunting him. You should be on our side, Caligula told him telepathically. You should want to help us. Hippocrates had refused. Perhaps he couldn't overpower his bullies, but he intended to fight them with every last bit of his soul. That's why he now looked so withered. I sent out a pulse of sympathy and regret. Hippocrates blasted it away with scorn. Just because we both hated the triumvirate did not make us friends. Hippocrates had never forgotten my cruelty. If he hadn't been constrained by the fascists, he would have already blasted me and my friends into a fine mist of atoms. He showed me that image in vivid color. I could tell he relished thinking about it. Meg tried to join our telepathic argument. At first, all she could send was a garbled sense of pain and confusion. Then she managed to focus. I saw her father smiling down at her, handing her a rose. For her, the rose was a symbol of love, not secrets. Then I saw her father dead on the steps of Grand Central Station, murdered by Nero. She sent Hippocrates her life story, captured in a few painful snapshots. She knew about monsters. She had been raised by the beast. No matter how much Hippocrates hated me, and Meg agreed that I could be pretty stupid sometimes, we had to work together to stop the triumvirate. Hippocrates shredded her thoughts with rage. How dare she presume to understand his misery? Rydna tried a different approach. She shared her memories of Tarkin's last attack on Camp Jupiter. So many wounded and killed, their bodies dragged off by ghouls to be reanimated as Rykulikai. She showed her Hippocrates her greatest fear, that after all their battles, after centuries of upholding the best traditions of Rome, the Twelfth Legion might face their end, tonight. Hippocrates was unmoved. He bent his will toward me, burying me in hatred. All right, I pleaded. Kill me if you must, but I'm sorry, I've changed. I sent him a flurry of the most horrible, embarrassing failures I'd suffered since becoming mortal, grieving over the body of Heloise the Griffin at the way station, holding the dying Pando's crest in my arms in the burning maze, and of course, watching helplessly as Caligula murdered Jason Grace. For just a moment, Hippocrates' wrath wavered. At the very least, I had managed to surprise him. He had not been expecting regret or shame for me. Those weren't my trademark emotions. If you let us destroy the fascists, I thought, will that free you? It will also hurt the emperors, yes? I showed him a vision of Reyna and Meg cutting through the fascists with their swords, the ceremonial axes exploding. Yes, Harpocrates thought back, adding a brilliant red tint to the vision. I had offered him something he wanted. Reyna chimed in. She pictured Commodus and Caligula on their knees, groaning in pain. The fascists were connected to them. They'd taken a great risk leaving their axes here. If the fascists were destroyed, the emperor might be weakened and vulnerable before the battle. Yes, Hippocrates replied. The pressure of the silence eased. I could almost breathe again without agony. Rena staggered to her feet. She helped Meg and me to stand. Unfortunately, we were not out of danger. I imagined any number of terrible things Hippocrates could do to us if we freed him, and since I'd been talking with my mind, I couldn't help but broadcast those fears. Hippocrates' Claire did nothing to reassure me. The emperors must have anticipated this. They were smart, cynical, horribly logical. They knew that if I did release Hippocrates, the gods' first act would probably be to kill me. For the emperors, the potential loss of their fashions apparently did not weigh the potential benefit of having me destroyed, or the entertainment value of knowing I'd done it to myself. Raina touched my shoulder, making me flinch involuntarily. She and Meg had drawn their weapons. They were waiting for me to decide. Did I really want to risk this? I studied the soundless god. Do what you want with me, I thought to him. Just spare my friends, please. His eyes burned with malice, but also a hint of glee. He seemed to be waiting for me to realize something, as if he'd written zap me on my backpack when I wasn't looking. Then I saw what he was holding in his lap. I hadn't noticed it when I was down on my hands and knees, but now that I was standing, it was hard to miss. A glass jar, apparently empty, sealed with a metal lid. I felt as if Tarkin had dropped the final rock into the drowning cage around my head. I imagined the emperors howling with delight on the deck of Caligula's yacht. Rumors from centuries before swirled in my head. The Sibyl's body had crumbled away. She could not die. Her attendants kept her life force, her voice, in a glass jar. Hippocrates cradled all that remained of the Sibyl of Cumae another person who had every reason to hate me. 
a person the emperors and Tarkin knew I would feel obligated to help. They had left me the starkest of choices. Run away, let the triumvirate win, and watch my mortal friends be destroyed or free two bitter enemies and face the same fate as Jason Grace. It was an easy decision. I turned to Reyna and Meg and thought as clearly as I could. Destroy the fascists. Cut him free. 